Father God, in the precious name of Jesus, we thank you and praise you for our coming together again. And Lord, we want to praise you and thank you for all that has been accomplished this day. And we thank you, Lord, for the deliverances, and we thank you, Lord, for the freedom and for the release that has come about in this group through your word and through the ministry of your spirit. And we just want to say thank you. And Lord, we marvel at the way you move, and we stand in awe of your gentleness. We stand in awe of your totality and how you minister to us in areas that you know we have need of. And now you seem fit to bring us back together again, to let us down a little deeper. We invite you, Lord Jesus, to stand even taller among us than you've already stood. And we would empty ourselves to the complete lordship of your spirit. And we would touch your highest for all those in which we're in contact with. And all those that might be tuning in by spirit at this precise moment. We ask you, Holy Father, to break the message to them. And we take lordship over all the principalities and powers. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to create an atmosphere in us and about us. And nestle us in the firmness and wholeness that is ours through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We would lift him up, that he and he alone might be seen, that the body of Christ may be ministered to and enlightened. The kingdom of God will be enhanced and Christ proclaimed as Lord. We thank you for the victory already. For the praise of his glory. Amen. You know, so much has happened to us, some of us today. So much has gone on today. And how many of you feel like you got growing paint? <laughs> praise the Lord. How many feel like you can't take any more? You've had enough. Huh? <laughs> well, you know, I was, I'm supposed to be talking about growth tonight. And we're dealing with maturing. And we have dealt with the fact that we need a new attitude. And we have accepted the reality. I pray that Jesus Christ has come into the world and into our lives, not to make us better, but to bring about a whole new us and to bring about a new order for our lives. And that we are not to remain emotionally, spiritually, or in understanding as children. But in totality of personality, we are to remain as little children. And he left ways and means by which we should grow. And you know, so often, you know, I see members of the body of Christ struggling to grow and working awfully hard at growing. And they have a way of taking their spiritual temperatures every now and then through circumstances in life to see whether or not they have grown. And they have a way of casting their eye at someone that appears to be more spiritual than themselves. And they look at themselves and say, uh, I'm really not growing because I can't pray like so and so. And I can't speak like so and so. So, but they never get around to tuning into the source to find out whether or not the life that is in them has grown because they're so busy casting their eye afar. 
And we only have one measuring stick, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And we grow as we grow in our knowledge and understanding of him. And in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, and the 13th verse, it reads that all these things, the, the five ministering gifts to the church in the form of men, pastors, evangelists, preachers, and teachers, and prophets, and apostles, was given for one specific purpose. And that specific purpose is that we, the members of Christ's body, might develop. That's a nice word for grow. That we might develop until we all attain a oneness. And that as we reach for this oneness, it's a oneness that we don't all have to be alike. And that we don't all have to act alike, but that we will attain the oneness that is the bond of unity of our relationship in Jesus Christ. That is the only way he wants us to be alike. That people will be able to look on us and know that we have like minds. Not that you pray like Revel. Not that you act like Revel. And have you ever noticed people that have sat under other folks, uh, under people's ministry, they take on the characteristics of the one who they have sat under? Sad. It's really sad. Because it robs you of your personality. Okay? And everything that you have developed in personality traits make up your uniqueness. And God chose you to be just what you are, but to grow in allowing his personality to have the preeminence and be expressed through your personality. And when you deny your own personality, you're denying himself and his wisdom. And I'm so thankful that I don't have to be like any of you. And that you don't have to attempt to be like me. Whatever task that God has given you, he's called you to that task and he wants your personality to come to the forefront as his personality shines through yours. But we've got a common bond. And that common bond is our relationship in Christ Jesus. And our relationship is Christianity. And it is not a friendship way. It's a kinship way. And I pray that you grasp that. If nobody goes, if your best friend don't go, you better. If you've got the enlightenment. Well, I'll let that alone. Okay. He says that he gives us these men and these ministries that we might develop until we all attain a oneness in the faith and in the comprehension of the full and accurate knowledge of the Son of God. We have to mature and grow up in the comprehension of the truth. Okay. I didn't know I was going this way, but evidently I am. And that truth is on three levels. We have literal or basic truth. We have psychological truth. And we have spiritual truth. And he gives us symbols for this. Okay. The basic truth or the literal truth is stone. Okay. The psychological truth is water. In psychology, you take psychological truth and it always comes out as water or the subconscious is, is depicted as water. Psychological truth, okay? But then 
when you get to spiritual truth, you find wine. And what, in order to grow, we have got to take the water and change it into wine. And the key to growing and changing psychological truth into wine, into spiritual truth, is found in John, the second chapter, and the second verse. You all know the story of the Feast of Canaan, the wedding feast. And when Jesus approached, uh, when Jesus was there enjoying himself, sorry about that, but he went to party. Um, and he was there enjoying himself, and all the mother came to him, and she said to him that the uh, wine has run out. And he says, well, what's that got to do with me? And she went to the servants of the feast of the man of the house, and she brought them to Jesus. And she said to him, which is the key to growth, whatsoever he say do, do it. And Jesus told him to go and get some water pots, stone and fill it with water and carry it to the king of the feast, to the governor of the feast. Okay. Now when the disciple, uh, when the servants and the mother knew that it was water that they put in them stone pots, okay, you all with me? Yeah. Okay. They knew that it was only water. And they had to take these stone pots, which is symbolic of the basics, okay? That which holds the basic, the literal truth, and take it and give it to the head. And they knew that they was giving him water. But in doing exactly what he told them to do, and the man tasted it, it became a spiritual truth. It became wine. But they knew they'd only put in water. Okay. Now the scripture goes on to say to us, that you can't take old wine, new wine, and put it in an old wine skin. Because if you do, when the wine starts to acting, it's going to swell up and bust the bag. <laughs> Sorry, paraphrase 20th century, ram up, okay? It's going to bust the bag, right? So you can't take new truth and put it into an old, worn-out vessel, me, and act the same way and expect to grow and turn out wine, spiritual truth, okay? There's got to be some kind of change that takes place. Because if I take the old, the new rather, and put it in with the old, the old is going to render the new useless. I cannot receive the things of God in my natural state, unregenerated, with no growth, because according to the word of God, it's foolishness. I can't even conceive of spiritual truth because I'm still running around in literal truth. I've read the word, and I know what it says, and I believe what it says, and the whole bit, and I'm going to take it strictly as it is said. But there's got to be an evolution that takes place within me, and that literal truth has got to become a psychological truth. Got to get in my kidney so I can deal with it, okay? My mind, that's kidney, okay? It's got to 
become water so it can filter through the kidney. <laughs> Because except it become a psychological truth, except I grasp it within my psyche and understand it, I ain't even going to deal with it. Okay. So I have got to have my whole psychic. Or I've got to have my mind, my emotions, my will, my passions, my reasoning, all changed to a brand new outlook before I can take another step. But if I want to take that spiritual truth, that wine, and put it into the old mold that I've had, I am going to miss. Why? Because I haven't reached up to another level, nor have I begun to think in a new way, and I'm still down there in the basics in the stone jars trying to drink wine and I haven't got through the process. Y'all with me? <laughs> huh? And an awful lot of people come to a seminar and they hear things that they have never heard before and they sit there with their minds and they try to grasp what I am saying as a spiritual truth. Okay, sounds good. Whew. Yeah. Oh, wow. Because what I'm I'm looking for self realization. I'm trying to grow. Okay, and I want to develop myself. Okay, so I'm scuffling to develop myself, and this sounds like a fantastic truth. Okay. So I'm going to grab this truth and I'm going to play with it. I'm going to eat it and I'm going to put a little salt and pepper on it and I'm going to chew it up a little bit and see what I come out with. But when I get through chewing it, and I get through handling it, it makes sense. But for some reason or other, it don't hold water. <laughs> I, I, I don't have the power. The, the reality of it is not there. Why? And I put it in with all the basics that I know and all the old stuff I know. And when I put it in there with the rest of that mess, I got a great big... Right. Hash. I got a great big mess. Why? Because the old way and my old understanding and my old ideas and my old tradition says, wait a minute. Now, that sounded good when she was here. But it just don't mix. Okay. So all the joy that you had sitting here listening to me and all the excitement that you had, you know, oh, yeah, huh? You know, you go back and you put it in them stone jars <laughs> and there's no change in your thinking, okay, in the water. Ain't no thinking. Your thinking is the same old thing. How do you expect to get it to wine? But it says we grow as we grow in the full personal and correct knowledge of Jesus Christ, so we grow through the word, okay? That's one way to grow. Another way to grow is that you put away childish things, okay? You stop making airplanes at tables when you're 30 like you did when you was 10. <laughs> huh? Why? Because you have begun to mature, and it is not Maturity for a 30-year-old woman to make airplanes at a dining room table in the midst of a congregation of people like she did when she was seven. I'm just using that as an example, okay? Y'all was looking and listening. Huh? But when you begin to grow, you will never know that the water is even changed to wine until you taste it. <laughs> as long as you're handling it, it won't be wine. Hello? <laughs> huh? It won't be wine. Since you put away childish things. Since when I was a child, I acted like a child. But when I matured and became a man, and how did he become a man? He became a man 
in his thinking. Okay? He got away from the basics. He got, and do you know there's a passage of scripture that will tell you about that? Hebrews, the sixth chapter, the first verse. And you know, as new creatures in Christ, we kind of forget about this and this new order that we are to bring about as we grow through the word. Paul says, therefore, let us go on and get past the elementary stage in the teachings of the doctrines of Christ, advancing steadily toward the completeness and the perfection that belongs to spiritual maturity. I'm just reading you what the word says, okay? Now, if you got anything to take it up with, you got to take it up with himself, okay? He says, let's go on to the completeness. Now, right, right away, he says, completeness means what? Totalness, wholeness. Now, you've already told me today you don't believe you're whole. Didn't some of you say you didn't believe you was whole this morning? Oh, okay, y'all ain't gonna talk to me tonight. Same crew that was here this morning. Okay. <laughs> It says the totalness, the completeness, and the perfection. Now, you don't believe you can even grow. You can become perfect. So your, your, your shoes are already pinching you, okay? <laughs> now, I, I, there's no way for me to be perfect in this life, right? You believe that, don't you? Then you just made the Lord a liar, and Paul too. Because <laughs> Paul said that what he expected was to be resurrected from the dead while he was still in his body, living. Oh, well, I'll go on. Anyhow. He said, let us not again be laying the foundation of repentance and abandonment of dead works, dead formalism, and a faith by which we turn to God with teachings about purifying the laying on of hands, the resurrection from the dead, and the eternal judgment and punishment. These are all matters of which you should have fully been aware a long time ago. So he said, if indeed God permit, we're going to now proceed to advance teaching. We're going to grow. But if we still back there playing Sunday school and we're still arguing about how you get in the kingdom and whether it's by, water, by dipping, sprinkling, immersion, or uh, whether or not it's uh, the proper way to do it, you know, and all these things. He said, we're going to do all of this. But let's grow on and get on to the advanced teaching because we're going to do all these things if God permits. But there's some truths that yet need to be revealed. And they need to be revealed to the world. And God can't reveal them because he is holding you and I responsible for carrying the word. And as long as we're back there trying to get good enough and perfect enough to be about the Father's business, we're holding up progress. Like I said to you, the enemy of your soul don't care how much you read the word. He don't care how much you chew it up. Just don't you believe it. Because if you start to believe in it, then you're going to act like it, and then you're going to press past all your mistakes and tune in and find out, well, it don't make no difference what I am or how good I am. God don't use me because I'm good enough. He uses me because I said, yes, Lord. You see, he don't say, F, get clean enough, and don't you never sin, and don't you never make a mistake, and then I'll check you out in a few years, and if you're okay, I'll use you. Huh? No, he uses you because you're available. And while he, and you see, he is the perfection. He is the equipment. He is the equipper. Okay, and he calls you to do a task, and then he does it for you, through you, in you, and as you. And you know that you ain't no good. So when you start to holler, I ain't no good, he said, yeah, I know, but I'm going to use you anyhow. Depend on me. I'm all good. I am all good, okay? 
But we're standing there like Moses, talking about, I can't talk. He said, yeah, I know, I'll give you a mouthpiece. Send Aaron down there with you. Yeah. That's what he said. And every argument that Moses gave him, he had one back for him. And then when Moses had to stand there and say, I'll go, just tell me who I'm supposed to say sent me. And he said, tell him I am that I am. I will be what I will be, and I will do what I will do when I get ready to do it. Now, he can't talk to us like that because we've got to check it out and find out why, when, how, you know, what's going to happen as a result of this. And if I do this, <laughs> what's in it for me? And, you know, <laughs> you know, and you can't grow worrying about you. Growth comes about because of dependency upon him. Cast yourself upon the Lord. Huh? He cares for you. Cast your burdens upon the Lord. Why? He said, I'm your burden there. He didn't say you wouldn't have them. He said, cast them. When you become aware of the fact you got one, get rid of it. No. That's too simple. Don't make me very Christian if I ain't got no burdens and I ain't all burdened down and can't nobody and can't nobody see that I'm being I'm struggling to be a good Christian. Don't make me holy. I ain't got no burdens. And somebody will come along and say, hmm. You're supposed to be such a good Christian and look at the conditions of the world and you ain't even concerned. You say, yeah, I ain't concerned. <laughs> Instead of coming back and saying, but I'm trusting in the Lord. God said all of this stuff was going to happen. Now what am I going to get up tight about it for? He said you're going to have wars and rumors of war. So they break out and go to fighting in Greece. My God. <laughs> you know? And the Lord said you're going to have wars. He said they got famines in, in, in um, Africa. Oh, my God, them poor people, the words say, you're going to have famine, you're going to have pestilence, you're going to have floods, you're going to have earthquake, and every time the news flashes on, you shake. Ugh. Huh? How you going to grow? You don't even believe the word of God. Huh. Well, but he didn't say don't be concerned, but he did say look up. When all these things start to happen, do something. Look up. Why? Your redemption is getting ready to draw nigh. Start putting on your escape and preparing your escape hatch because all y'all think you're going to jump up and float away anyhow. Huh? You do. And everybody's running around talking about when is he going to come and how is he going to come and, and, and quaking and shaking and scared to death and, the, you know, the visions and the prophecies is going on. And, the whole, and, you know, then I have to stand up and say, hey, Lord, but you said in your word, no man, not even you knew the day nor the hour, except the father who didn't even reveal it to the son. And if he's sitting at the right hand of the father and he's got everything under control, what am I sweating it for? But I know one thing, that if I stay tuned and keep my channels open, that whenever there's anything that's going to happen, I'll know about it. But I won't have to be frightened of that. I won't have to be uptight. But you see, we still racked it with the basic truth, the literal truth. We haven't grown in it. He said, grow in your what? Your understanding. How? By taking the new truths. He said strong meat in Hebrews 5 belongs to those whose senses are exercised by reason of use to develop. You can't take a baby and give a baby steak no matter how you try. You'll choke it and kill it and you have to bury it. But he said strong meat, spiritual truth belongs to those whose senses are exercised. That's development. What do you do when you exercise? You develop. Hmm? Yeah. You ever try weighting, lifting weights? There is an outward manifestation that you've been lifting weights. They call them muscles. 
you know, outward, you know what I'm talking about, them outward man, them little bulges that get up there in your arm, you know, there's an outward manifestation that you've been back there somewhere behind the, the barn or in the living room or down in the basement somewhere, you know, there will be an outward manifestation that you've done something in secret. <laughs> You will have grown. If you take God at his word. Now he said that the deep things of the spirit are revealed to us by the spirit. And he said you'll grow in the completeness of the personality of Christ if you learn about him. So growing and growth and maturity don't come by struggling to grow. It comes by learning about him. It does not come about by being more spiritual. It don't come about by fasting and not eating meat. A vegetarian don't help you to grow. Being a vegetarian don't help you to grow. Okay. Nor your heightened sensitivity to spiritual things don't help you to grow. Sorry about that. It's your relationship and getting to know the personality of Jesus Christ that causes you to grow. And when Jesus did his growing, he grew on all four planes. He grew mentally. He grew spiritually. He grew in relationship to his fellow men. He grew socially. And he grew what other way? What other way? Right on. And, 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 and you're one of the youngest ones here. Did you struggle to grow, baby? Did you struggle to become what you are? Hmm? You struggled to become as tall as you are? You really struggled at it. You worked very hard to be as tall as you are. But I mean as tall as you are. You struggled to get there. No, no, I didn't ask you about no time. I asked you, did you struggle? How'd you struggle? What did you do to help yourself to grow? That helped you to grow. I'm talking about growing physically now. What did you do to help yourself to grow physically? Nothing. Not a thing did you do. You just went through the process of living. Oh, well. Just lived. That's all. Just lived. Let's look at another passage of scripture, okay? Let's see if I can find it. It is fun. Huh? In 1 Corinthians 14, 20, let's see what it says here. It says, brethren, do not be children immature in your thinking, nor continue to be babes in matters of evil, but in your minds be mature men. Don't that taste pretty good? And how did I tell you it grew? Hmm? Just live and do what? And learn about him. Because maturity is the completeness of personality found in him. It's not how well you learn the scriptures. It's not how well you get in tune with other people or the universe. It's how much do you know about him. Because the more you fall in love with him and the more time you spend with him, there's a transaction that takes place. And do you know what the transaction is? Do you know what the transaction is? 
Look at it. And then the guy said, I beheld him as the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and full of mercy. And as I beheld him, and as I looked upon him, something happened to me. I became as him. Beloved, see what manner of love that the Father has bestowed upon us. That right now, we are the sons of God. It matters not what he looks like. But we know that when he appears, we will see him as he is. For we shall be just like him. Second Corinthians three eighteen. I think it's Second Corinthians three eighteen. I think it is. It says something here. And all of us, as with unveiled, now I've, now I've used this term so many times this weekend. With unveiled face, because we continue to behold in the word of God, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are constantly being transfigured into his very own image in ever-increasing splendor and from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Y'all didn't hear that. Didn't even grasp that, did you? Y'all, you, you really didn't grasp that, did you? It was too wordy for you, wasn't it? Huh? You got lost trying to figure it out with your mind what I was saying, didn't you? Okay, put it in my own translation. He said, you look at me, and maybe while you're looking at me, you'll become what I am. That's all, it's just that short and sweet. He said, you look at him with unveiled face. In other words, but I've got to be honest enough to take me to him as I am and not be so concerned about being stripped and seeing what I am and saying how naked I am. Because he told us this morning through the word of God to strip off this old unregenerated self and he didn't, but he didn't say stand there naked and look at your nakedness. He said, put ye on. Huh? No, he said, put ye on who? The clothing of righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't stand there naked. So then if I have to do this, then I can't stand up and say, hey, God, I'm unrighteous. Because he have to look back and say, I'm clothed in his righteousness. I made a transfer. You know, beloved, why we can't stand any taller Bob in the Lord? We're fighting an ego trip, right? And we don't have sense enough to know that ego got a forwarding address when Jesus stepped in. Ego and Jesus don't abide in the same place. What is wrong with that? Do you know where ego went when Jesus came out? Huh? It got lost, and there was a transfer. Ego got down off the heart, of, off the throne of your heart, and Jesus sat down, full occupancy, hung out a sign, fully occupied. Well, you can't grow if you still think you're fighting an ego, right? But if you know that it is, your house is fully occupied, there ain't no room for no more because he said it's fully occupied. Ain't nothing else can be there but himself. Hmm? How come you can't accept your growth if you're fully occupied? You got hot air? <laughs> And we running around killing spirits, jumping over chairs, and walking and looking over our back and casting shadows and to see whether or not we got a shadow or anything like that. And we don't have sense enough to know, stand still, house is fully occupied. 
The only way anything can get in is if you become unoccupied. And the one that's sitting on the throne of your heart said, I ain't getting up. And when you accept that reality, what can you do but grow? If we would only learn what has been already accomplished for us, through us, and in us, we would get up off the stool and do nothing and stop running around like little children in our thinking and our understanding and fighting and struggling with a battle that is already won and what all the screens would come down and we would stop shadow boxing. Do you know we're spiritual shadow boxing? And you can't grow if you're fighting something. And you're looking back down the road, you can't find any progress because you only progress by going. Hmm? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but he said, all you have to do to grow is look at me. Look in the word. See me in the word. And behold yourself as in a mirror. That all that he is, he's that in me. And then I stand in my nothingness and I bow to his totalness. And as I look at his totalness, I find that I become total. Okay? Or I stand in my insufficiency and I say, hey, God, I bow. I stand in my insufficiency and I bow to your own sufficiency. And then I hear him say, hey, Ev, in your weakness, I'm strong. Well, hey, God, Jesus, you're strong and you're strong in me. Well, what am I standing here fighting this, with this weakness for? Why don't I turn around and look at your strength? Well, if I look at his strength, what happens to my weakness? It's gone. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, I am weak. Okay? The basic truth says he is strong, okay? That's the literal truth, okay? And I am weak, he is strong. The spiritual truth says that as we become one, I am no longer weak because my strength is in him, okay? And you know what that does? You cannot sit down like this and hide in all of your weakness when he comes striding across the hills, leaping and bounding in all his splendor and all his beauty and all his tremendous strength. And you say, Who? Who's that coming? I better run and hide. Because he might see me. I'm weak. But you step out to meet him out there and said, here he comes. Oh, hearken, who's that? My beloved skipping on the hill. <laughs> Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Here he comes. And I'm standing there anxiously awaiting him. And I've gotten so excited about the love of my life is coming. And he's coming to me, you know. And he's coming to rescue me wherever I am on the crevice of life, about to fall off. Here comes my knight in shining on. Always available. And I don't have to shrink and hide that I'm standing there on the crevice and I don't have to shake and quake because he's going to find me out there in that precarious position. And he says, hey. I'll make your feet like Heinz feet. He said, you on the crevice? Yeah. Leave. <laughs> 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 
But you know, he's, but what are you saying? But my feet are too broad. I just came out the valley. He said, leap. <laughs> and in the process of leaping between the time you leap and the time you get down, I guarantee you'll have hind feet. But if you find yourself in the valley before you get off the mountain, I'll broaden your footsteps for the valley so that your foot won't slip. I, the Lord thy God, do all these things. And you know what? You don't even have to know when it becomes high and steep or whether the steps broaden out because all you do is trust. And before you know it, the water has turned into wine. In the process of living, in the process of maturing, okay? But if the wine stays in the skin too long and ferments too long, it becomes vinegar. But only he knows the proper time for it to become wine. He knows when you're ready to be used. But some of us have become vinegar sitting down, waiting. Soon as I process and age a little bit more, you can use me. <laughs> and you don't have sense enough to know you're vinegar. <laughs> because you want to call the shots and he's trying to say, come on, the wine is ready. I want to use you. But I don't think I've, I've got enough knowledge. And he said, okay, go on and be vinegar. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Of course that means you're limiting God. That still means that you're running the show and you've got the reins and you're going to tell him when, where, how, and the whole bit, and he's not Lord. Okay. And as long as you're looking at yourself and not looking at him, you are not going to grow. I've heard people say, you know, like, okay, I'm the best old fruit inspector. He says, you shall know them by their fruit. So we run around and we're fruit inspectors. <laughs> yeah, expecting everybody's fruit, you know. You don't understand that, huh? You examine everybody and looking at everybody and measuring everybody, and then somebody says something to you. Oh, well, I'm just inspecting the fruit. After all, you'll know the fruit by the you know the tree by the fruit it bears. And you're so busy looking at everybody else's fruit, you don't even know you got apples on your own tree. Hmm? Feel like you get growing pain. Huh? Do you know something about growth? You don't know you're growing until you find yourself in a life situation and you realize that you're not reacting the way that you would have reacted three years ago or five years ago. You don't, you don't grow by inspecting yourself. You grow by allowing yourself to be put in life situations. It's hot in here, isn't it? Okay. What kind of heat do you think is in here? Huh? Spiritual energy. And y'all just as busy being uncomfortable and fanning and, and the whole bit, you know, trying to get it to go down. Y'all want me to shut up. It's the only way it's going to cool off. <laughs> Open the door and burn, baby, burn. <laughs> Because you know when the fire gets hot enough, do you know what happens? When the fire gets hot enough, the dross goes off the silver and the gold gets melted and it becomes refined. Okay? If the word of God don't find you and it don't make you squirm and it don't make you say guilty, Lord, it ain't doing its job. Anytime that you come together and you sit and think you're going to sit down under the word of God and be comfortable, you might as well stay home. 
because the word of God will find you where you are. Okay, some of you are saying, oh, so I haven't grown. I'm still back there playing with the basics. But all the Spirit of God is saying is that you haven't grown. So all you have to do is say, hey, God, I want to grow. And he says, okay, you want to grow? Get in the Word. Stop acting like a child. Start exercising your faith. Start moving in the realm of faith. Don't sit there and cry and moan and groan that you haven't grown. Say, okay, Lord, I'm guilty. I want to grow. Help me, I dare you. And then buckle your seatbelt. <laughs> hmm? Right on. Right on. Okay. Now, you came here this weekend. You knew what the title was. Maturity. And if you didn't want to grow, you had a business coming. Right? And the word of God my Bible says it's like a two-edged sword. It cuts going out, and it cuts coming in. And I'm telling you, you cannot be comfortable while you're being sliced both ways. <laughs> it's impossible to be comfortable, and you get that every way you turn. Huh? But you know, we get so good, we sit down on the stool and do nothing, and we get comfortable in our relationship, and oh man, I'm, you know, we be, you know, I'm not done. Found me a nest and I'm going to sit here and get comfortable. And he's, mm hmm, I'm pulling. And then you know, he does just like the eagle, stirs up his nest and starts taking all the down out. And then he thinks, you know, you're going, oops, you know. Yeah, yeah, that, there's a rock in there somewhere. You know, there's a, huh? A thorn. Ooh, there's a thorn. And anyway, until you get the wiggling and turn until you say, okay, and you come out the nest running. Because it's so uncomfortable. Okay? Or he'll let that stuff get down there and churn and churn and churn until you holler, oh, God, have mercy. And then he says, I have mercy. I need help. He said, yeah, I've been waiting for you to get around and recognizing the fact you need it. And do you know what? He don't get upset because you need help. He says, what can I do for you? What do you need? You know, and he starts to call you by your name. What's the matter, Anne? And you go and you start to cry, you know, and he just starts to love you and wiping away the tears, you know, with no condemnation. And, you know, it takes growth. And humility comes about because you don't have, no, you don't have no business being loved used because of what you are. Every time the Lord heals somebody through me, I become more nothing. Okay? And what will be, what is really mind-blowing, especially if you haven't done anything to get together, you know, all the preliminaries like fasted and prayed and sat behind the mountain for three days and and all that kind of stuff, and then the Lord sends you by to, to pray for somebody, and they get healed, you know, and you know that you haven't done your homework, at least that's what you thought you should have been doing, and he do it anyhow, in spite of you. <laughs> That'll make you nothing. And you know, one of the greatest ways to grow is that I began to look at his faithfulness to himself. And you know, I discovered something. God don't have to be faithful to me. And God don't have to be faithful to you. If he just be faithful to himself and to what he said, that because of our relationship, do you know that you and I are going to get the overflow? Huh? We're going to get the overflow. Because he said he watches over his word and he hastens to perform it. And if we're standing between him and the word, what's going to happen? Hmm? Well, keep on struggling to grow, you know, and keep on working it out your own self. 
You keep on stumbling and falling instead of rising up to the place about it. If he's going to do it, why don't I let him? Hmm? And you know what it does? It empties my hands. And then I'm in the place of receptivity. Because I put down the brooms and the mops in my mind. You know, the weeds are out of my mind, and I ain't thinking, and I ain't in a turmoil. And he can come along and say, oh, there's a fertile field. Plop. <laughs> Saw a seed there. Hmm. There's that one. Hmm. Yeah. Let's see, he's got a couple needs. Plop. Oh, Cable's been struggling long enough. Well, he's finally let go. Blah, 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 blah. It's so simple. And you wake up, and you're all refreshed, and all of a sudden you know what you know, and you know that you know it, and you don't know how you ever got about it. Because he said, I'll speak to a man once, and I'll speak to a man twice, and then I will seal my instructions in the night hour. Instead of don't sweat it, go to bed and go to sleep on it. And wake up in the morning refreshed. Ah, that's it. And then you can't take no credit for it. That's if you grow. Okay? All hearts and minds I know are very clear. Huh? Hmm? Huh? Hmm? Okay. Tape's long enough, ain't it? No. Hmm? Tape's long enough. I don't want to overcrowd you. Huh? Tell them how long I've been speaking in. <laughs> and you see, he said, if, if I wasn't too long, when did you get it cheaper? <laughs> Cut the tape off because we're going to pray, that's all. You want the prayer on there? Okay. Okay. Did the word find you? Huh? Okay. Let's talk to God about where he found us at. Because, you see, we've been struggling to grow, and we have to holler guilty, Lord. But I haven't grown. I haven't attempted to grow according to your way. I haven't put down the childish thing, nor have I picked up your word, or have I struggled to learn about you. I've been running around in the periphery, picking up every other thing, and trying to grow myself rather than allow you to grow in me. Okay? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your word finding root in the hearts of your people. And Lord, we stand and we say guilty is charged. And we release ourselves from that guilt, not because we're good enough, but because the blood of Jesus cleanses from all unrighteousness. And we realize that we've struggled in our own way. And you've pointed us to the way, which is Jesus. And we want to know more about you. Teach us. Holy Spirit, teach us about Jesus. And dear Jesus, grow up in us. Because we let go and say, have your own way in all of our lives. Thank you, Lord. Amen.